Okay folks, uh, let's start um, today's uh, class. So welcome to the first class for Communication and Culture, colon, Theories and Approaches. Uh, from now on we're going to abbreviate that very long title to CCTA. Okay, so if I speak about CCTA, um, that's exactly uh, what we're talking about. Um, so after just consulting with Sandra, um, uh, I think we should have about 10 students. We've now got eight, so a couple of people maybe can't make it at the moment, but they might arrive later. Uh, as I said in the email, which hopefully I think everybody got, because you're all here, um, that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Um, so um, you know how to use Zoom and uh, you know how to use Moodle, so we're several steps down the road to enlightenment already. Um, so before we start, because normally what we're trying to do this year, in fact what we've been doing since March, is that we've been trying to replicate normal life as much as possible. And I know it's very different, uh, difficult when you're sitting at home or sitting on your bed and trying to do a class. Um, but in normal times what we would do is, I, at this point, I would just get everybody to very briefly just introduce themselves because it, this is a social activity teaching. Um, and one of the things I find hard about this remoteness is not having folks in the same room as well. Um, so could everybody just one by one just just say a few words about yourself just say hello and you can tell me whatever you want to tell but literally a sentence or two okay folks thank you very much now let's without further ado let's move on uh, with the class so if you go on to uh, Moodle you're all familiar with Moodle all of those of you who have uh, well you all will be now because you've been here for a week or so go to Moodle go to CCTA and you'll notice in week one um, I've now um, made the um, PowerPoint available so please open the PowerPoint but please and it's really important resist the urge to start flicking through it because that's what I used to do when I was a student because I was very impatient um, and I'm sure impatience and eagerness there's a fine line between the two um, so I, I, I appreciate you're all eager but try not to be impatient um, so let's um, just open it and we'll go through it sequentially but try not to jump ahead with the PowerPoint. The, the important things obviously about about this class are the timings of the class itself and uh, what we're going to study and the assessment so I, I've tried to condense all of that onto slide number two um, so we all made it to uh, Friday's online class 10 o'clock congratulations well done that's a good start um, so as you know all of the classes will be online um, until further notice, I was thinking about this the other day, if things get better, and hopefully they will, with lockdowns and social distancing, I, I do actually prefer to see students in real life. It makes a, a bit of a difference in my mind. So if things get better, then you can expect to see me on campus and we can have real life tutorials. Um, but as things stand, we're going to do everything remotely. And the good thing here, folks, is that from March until September just gone, um, on the MA course, I teach on MA journalism, in fact I'm the convener, and we successfully taught that class for six months. So please don't worry about whether you're going to get something major from this teaching, you will, uh, because we're now quite good at it because we've been doing it for six months. It's not going to be perfect, but we'll do whatever we can. Um, so looking at the lecture schedule, introduction today, um, and then you'll notice, I won't go through it in detail, but you'll notice that the, the teaching is, is, is divided into two responsibilities, myself, GM, and uh, CR, who is my colleague, uh, Dr. Chris Roberts. So Chris, I think, is going to do four classes, and I'm going to do five or six, I think it is, and then the two of us will do the last class together. There's our email uh, addresses at the bottom, so you can get in touch with us. Uh, the assessments, when we finish the formal class today, what we're going to do for the final hour, which is the tutorial hour, or would normally be the tutorial hour, what I want to, you to do is to read a PDF that I will make available on um, Moodle, and that will describe uh, the assessments. What I don't want students to do is to start worrying about assessments before we've done the class, because especially bright, um, eager students tend to do that. So let me just briefly tell you about the assessments. So there are three, um, and there two of them are in December and one of them is in January. So the first one, and again you can read about this later on, uh, but essentially what you need to do is make a poster. And the poster, in normal times, it would be about an A1 size, about this size. I'm putting my hands out here. 
excuse me, we've got a late arrival. Um, and the, the poster is basically a description of your research idea. So think about it as a photograph or a PowerPoint slide that describes your research idea. And what you have to do there is produce a poster, submit it via Turnitin, and then over Zoom, Chris and I will talk to you about your poster for about 10 or 15 minutes. So that's assessment number one. Assessment number two is a 1,000 word uh, collection of blog entries, um, four at 250 words. It doesn't sound a lot, but to do it well, it is actually quite a lot of work because you have to refer to academic works and talk about theories and blend them in with your understanding and so on. Again, we can you can read more about that um, when we finish the class, uh, when I release the PDF. And the big piece of work is the critical reflection. So this essentially is taking the idea that you started on your poster and taking it to the next stage. Now, the genius about this uh, module is that it starts to prepare you for the dissertation, uh, which you'll start thinking about in January, February uh, next year. So the idea is to sow the seeds and to get you familiar with some techniques and theories and approaches to media research um, so that in January or February you can hit the ground running and uh, produce a wonderful uh, dissertation which of course uh, constitutes quite a lot of your um, overall mark. Um, so and, and the other thing just to reiterate we do have um, tutorial time so in normal weeks what we'll have 10 until 12 a class we'll have a short break and then 12 or 10 past 12 until one o'clock. Um, normally we'd have like seminars and discussions but we can't really do it online um, so what we will do is I'll make myself basically an open door policy. Um, so if you want to discuss your ideas or if there's anything you don't understand or whatever, then we can have a, an online tutorial. Um, so before we move on, any, any questions about that? Like I said, you can read much more about the assessments later. Don't, don't worry too much at the moment. Um, so any questions about that? If I don't hear anything, I'm assuming the answer is no. Okay, moving on. Um, so, um, slide number three, the purpose of the, the, the module. As I hinted more than anything else, um, I, and when we write module descriptions, we're encouraged by the university to use all this kind of semi-accessible language, and we talk about paradigms and theories and all, and all that sort of stuff, and I, I don't really care for that too much, so I've tried to rephrase it in sort of normal English. And really, this is what this module is about, to encourage you to think about the value of me media research. In other words, why do we do it? Why do we spend days, hours, months, years sometimes actually analysing media? What is the point of media research? Um, and to do that, obviously, point number two, you as students and as, as, as uh, embryonic researchers, you need to engage with media related issues. Um, so, for example, things like representation, ethnic representation in the media, for example, is a media-related issue. One of the things that I'm very passionate about, the political content of news, of what we see on BBC, CNN, the political content. Um, there's loads of media-related issues, and really, folks, it's your choice what you do, which media-related issue you follow for your assessed work. It's not my choice, it's not Chris's choice, it's your choice. So we're trying to get you excited about engaging with media related issues. Uh, the third point, which is what it says on the, on, the, on the module description to explain some key theories and approaches to media research. Personally, I'm more of a fan of the approaches than the theories. I struggle with theories in media research. It doesn't mean they're not valid, but I struggle because Ultimately, media is all about people, and it's very difficult to theorise about human beings who are emotional and changeable and passionate and that sort of thing. We're not talking natural sciences here. We'll talk more about that a bit later on. Uh, point number four, to start doing your own research. So the idea here is with the poster and the critical reflection is to start the ball moving on your own ideas uh, to get you moving and doing your own original research. And obviously, point number five, uh, within your doing your research, you will start to apply the theories and approaches. So those are the five sort of uh, five headed uh, um, uh, purposes of this module. Uh, more than anything else, we, I really want you to just to engage and with, with media issues and to see how you can do research that will make, that will illuminate these issues, that will make things a bit clearer uh, for all of us. And so I'm jumping ahead here because essentially that is the, the, the purpose of 
uh, media research. Um, you've all given very brief introductions. Let me just do one for myself. Um, so as you can tell by looking at me, I'm uh, pretty old. Uh, so one of the things about being old is that you tend to have accumulated quite a lot of experience through your life. Um, and as you can see by this rather busy uh, slide, uh, my professional life basically has been divided between journalism, freelance journalism, for 14 years and almost, almost 20 years of teaching experience. And as you can see, I've taught at, this is my sixth university. Um, and I calculated when I did this slide that I've taught over 800 classes and I'm, 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 I'm almost getting it right now after all that time. I, I'm, I'm relatively good. I still make mistakes, but I, I'm, I'm getting there. And, um, and I've taught students from all over the world, uh, probably about 1,600. A lot of the internationals were at Cardiff, which were, was a, a big international journalism school. Um, and at the bottom there, that explains briefly, I did my PhD at Goldsmiths. You've probably heard of Goldsmiths. And my real specialism, although I'm interested in a lot of things, is the sociology of journalism, which is what I'll be talking about next week in class. Um, and the sociology of journalism, you can actually extend it quite easily to the sociology of media in general. Uh, but we'll talk more about that next week. Uh, and the rest of the slide, you can see my book and some of the magazines I've written for, etc, etc. Um, so without wishing to big myself up a little bit, after all these years of actually being a journalist and teaching journalism and studying journalism, I hope you've got yourself a good teacher here. I wouldn't say I'm the greatest, but I'm slowly but surely getting the hang of it, like I said. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, folks, now I'm going to throw it back to you. Um, and I'm going to give you six questions. Um, first question. Please write it, just jot it down on a piece of paper, folks. For question number one, and don't jump ahead, don't jump ahead. I want to know what you think and believe. I don't want to know what Google thinks or Wikipedia. Right, the question number one, how much of the UK is densely built up. When I say densely built up, what it means is buildings, houses, apartments, factories, office blocks, shopping centres, roads, railways, and that sort of thing. So give me a, a score between zero and a hundred percent. You're probably thinking, what's this got to do with media? All will be revealed. Question number two. Out of every £100 paid in welfare benefits, how much is lost to fraud? So this is something which you hear about in the news quite a lot, you know. Out of £100 paid in welfare benefits, how much is lost to fraud? Choose a number between zero, which means none of it is lost to fraud, to £100, which means all of it is lost to fraud. Question number three, um, well it doesn't say it here, but in the UK. What proportion of girls under 16 years old get pregnant each year? So you can either give, give us a percentage or a one in, you know, one in two, one in three, one in four. What proportion of girls under 16 get pregnant each year in the UK? And number four, what proportion of the UK population are immigrants. Now the, 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 the problem with this question is I, I don't actually know what the definition of an immigrant is because when you think about it we're all immigrants. You know whether you believe the Bible story Adam and Eve that means we all came from probably the Middle East or Africa or if you believe the Darwinian explanation we all came from Kenya so we're all immigrants really but you know what I mean by that I think the implication is it is kind of you know recent immigrants. Okay, so have a little ponder there, and what I want to do, this is so much easier in class, but hopefully we can do it now. Um, what I want you to do is just, when I go through your names, just shout out your answers to, to each question as they come along. Um, so we're going to start at the top. Um, Taylor, your answer for question number one. Right, I wish I could see all your faces now when I reveal what the answer is. Go to the next slide, folks. 0.1%. 0.1%. So, and and don't, don't, be, don't be upset by this, because I did this with the class last year, and their estimates were in a similar sort of bracket to yours. So the average of your guess is probably about 45-50%. The only person who was anywhere near was Saida. Congratulations, Saida. 0.1%. 0 .1, 0 .1%. Okay, 0.1%, but look at the notes there. It also says the findings show that the public hugely overestimate the figure with a mean guess of 47%. So you're in good company. 
the general public and you as a group of 10 students, you're guessing around about the same with the exception of Saida. But the actual statistic is 0.1%. The next slide, if you look at that map, um, that shows um, the United Kingdom, Scotland at the top, Northern Ireland, Wales and so on. The green area is either farmland or natural, in other words countryside. The only built up areas are the red bits. So that's how land is used in the UK, that's built up. And it doesn't mean densely built up, 5.9%, that actually means things like parks and, uh, and so on. So folks, we're a long way out on that first question, let's go to the second question, same again, let's just go down, down the list. Please don't change your mind, because you're probably thinking, oh there's a trend here, I'm going to overestimate. So, so just go with your initial figure. Taylor, how much of, is uh, fraud, welfare benefits is fraud? The average guess, next slide, so you're in good company here again folks, so you are quite typical of the British population, the average guess for the, when, when, when people were surveyed in general is £24, which is, you're, you're slightly higher, you're about 30, but you've said 24, the actual figure is 70p which is less than £1, that's less than 1% is that, these are government figures and the government always likes to put these things in negative light because it doesn't like paying welfare benefits. So the actual official figure is less than a pound. But you've all guessed at 30 and the general public guessed at 24. So again, we're miles out. So we are miles out with the, how much is built up of the UK. And we're also miles out with welfare fraud. Third question, what proportion of girls under 16 get pregnant each year? Right, so your average guess is around about 10, apart from Saida who thinks it's uh, 50. Uh, the, the general guess is, you, you're around about the same as the general population, the general guess is 15%, one in six girls. The actual figure, and you know what, there's a trend developing here, the actual figure, folks, is much smaller. It's 0.6%, it's less than one in a hundred. Less than one in a hundred. So the closest person there um, was Manisha with her one in 40. Uh, which is still twice as high as it actually is. And last but not least, let's move on to question four. What proportion of the UK population are immigrants? Like I said, a bit hazy about how we actually define what an immigrant is, because we're all immigrants, really. Right, let's move on, the same pattern as before. The average guest, so you're, in, you're quite representative of the UK population, folks. You, you estimated 30, 35, 25, so the average guess in the UK is 31%. Um, the actual figure is 13%. So again, much lower. So in each of these four examples, you as a group, you've done two things. One, you've reflected the UK population because your guesses are quite similar. And secondly, you, like the UK population, are a long way out from reality. Okay, and I don't feel bad about it because you're in good company uh, because the rest of the UK population, this was a survey that was done um, in uh, 2013, but I've seen other surveys since and comparing people's perception against reality and the, the disparity is quite consistent between uh, the people and the facts. So question number five, and, and this is a bit of an issue really, because I, I don't know what it is, but quite a few of you, I can't, your connections, your vocal connections are actually quite poor. I don't know why. Um, so what I will do, I mean, you can dive in if you like, but I will ask it and probably answer it. Um, well, no, I'll throw it out to you because it's a, a good question. I got my own, own ideas, but question five, why are we and the general public so wrong about the world around us? Yeah. Right, very good. Worse, right, very good. Kate said, I don't know whether you could hear that. Again, Kate, you're breaking up a bit, but I kind of pieced it together. Um, so Kate was saying, correct me if I'm wrong, you're saying that it depends on your own personal experience, what you see out of your window and so on. Um, any more comments on that? But you also said that you think the media kind of build things up and exaggerate and distort the truth, right? Anybody else got any comments on this? Right, so people's opinion are sometimes wrong. I, I, so happy you said that, Henry, because that blends into a slide that I'm going to do in about 20 minutes. 
So Kate said it depends on your personal experience and also the media tend to distort things and Henry said it's also social media as well. Um, you're, you're both absolutely right. I mean, they're, they're, they're both factors, um, the, the media and people's perceptions. Um, and, and a good example here, and what amazes me, because I've lived in London um, and I've lived elsewhere in the country as well, and um, my, my family routes are actually up north. So for the past 30, 40 years, I've been traveling up and down the motorway or the train. And, and the, the thing is about how much of Britain is built up. I've always thought that it's hardly anything because I've traveled up and down the motorway a lot. And the thing about living in London is that a lot of people never, never leave London. So your idea of normality is London. You know, but if you look at that map, if you've ever been to Scotland, Scotland is 99% empty. It's quite dramatic. So it's all about your personal experience. So if you live in Battersea or Wandsworth or, or um, Barnes or somewhere in London and you go to school, you go to university, you go to the shops, that's your world. You would think that everywhere is built up. And likewise, London is ethnically more diverse than the rest of the country. So most of you, when you talk about immigrants, uh, was that question number... For most of you are saying 35 45 percent and that's probably right for london about half of london people in london do come from elsewhere but you go to somewhere like up north or cornwall or scotland and the figure is much 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 lower much 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 lower so it's all about your personal experiences but it's also about the media as well so which leads us leads us neatly onto slide number 23 question six why do we believe what we believe? Now there's a big question, there's a deep philosophical question. Why do we believe what we believe? And we all, all of the people here in this room, we kind of believe some things the same, but we also have very diverse beliefs as well. So where do our beliefs come from? Again, don't jump ahead, let's, let's just chat about it for a minute. Anybody, just dive in. Tell me why you believe what you believe. Have you ever thought about this? Because these, these beliefs, they don't just suddenly pop up in our brain, they come from somewhere, right? Let me help you out. Some of our, go on Saeed, are you going to say something? It's the media and the news which we hear, because they put a lot of attention on probably the minor things, but they inflate it uh, so that people have different perceptions, like immigration, for example. Yes, right. It's constantly in the news, constantly hear that. Right. So let me just stop, let me just stop you Saeed, let me just stop you Saeed, let me stop you, you're, you're absolutely right, right? You're absolutely right, but it's not as simple as that, is it? And th this is one thing that I want to encourage everybody to think about. And I, I've, I've read this before in student essays. It's okay to say it in week one, but please don't say it or write it in week 10, right? The media does not tell us what to think, right? The media tells us what to think about, but we are all intelligent, selective thinking people, and we can decide whether something is true or not. So, and this is a theory which goes back 50 or even 100 years. In fact, the Nazis in Germany used it. They believed that if you tell somebody something enough, they will, everybody will believe it. People are a bit more sophisticated these days. And thank goodness we don't believe everything that comes out of politicians' mouths. We're sceptical about it. So you're right to a point, Sai, that the media plays a role. But what else? What else? It's not as simple as that, is it? It goes, it goes way back to our childhood, doesn't it? It goes back to what, what, what our parents tell us. Go on, Cecily. Our culture, the way we were raised, our culture, um, where we grew up, what area we grew up in. Yeah. All of those have factors. Yeah, yeah. It's, the point is, Cecily, it's multifaceted, isn't it? Yeah? Mm -hmm. So you've got what you learn from your parents, you've got what you learn from your siblings, and then you go to school, and then like you say, you've got your local area. So if you were growing up in Arkansas, somebody exactly the same as you growing up in London probably might possibly believe different things. They'd have a different vision of normality because of where they live, right? And you've probably had different schooling and so on. Um, so it's a, it's a whole... <clears throat> it's a whole mess of stuff. It's a whole number of factors. So next slide. Let's move on to the next slide. <coughs> Excuse me. So slide 24. The first word on that list, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure whether we're actually born with stuff that we believe. You know, things like, you know, um, that, that, that fire is dangerous, for example, all this sort of animal instinct stuff. I think we probably are with the stuff that we know. You know, that if you see a little yellow and black buzzy insect it's probably going to sting you. I think that's probably something that, you know, that we, certainly other animals learn that inherently. Obviously you learn stuff from family and, and really this is kind of chronological. Family comes first 
and if you have a strong faith, if you're born into a, a strong Christian or a strong Muslim family, that's going to be really important. Say so you'll have those uh, points of view um, uh, uh, to, to absorb when you're very young. And then you go to school and then you start mixing with friends. And then there are other people that you mix and mingle with. And then, really important, your own life experience. Now, I don't know about you folks, maybe you're you're a lot younger than me, but I've certainly learned over my life that things I was taught at school and things I, dare I say, told about my parents, they're not actually true. You know, they didn't lie to me specifically, but they're not, they don't tally with my life experience. And last but not least, as Saeed has so, um, so uh, insightfully said, the media. But just be aware, the media does not cancel out all of those other factors. Because a lot of those other factors, faith in particular, is really deeply seated. It takes a, that's why it's called faith, right? You have faith in, in your uh, religious beliefs. Some people don't have religious beliefs. Some people do, of course. So the media. So next slide. When we talk about the media, and I'm sure that you know this, but I, I, the reason I put this slide in is because a lot of my undergrads, when they talk about the media, they don't actually know what it is. Uh, but the media extends really in its in its broadest sense from everything from Michelangelo paintings all the way to Instagram. So it's anything which conveys a message, anything that conveys meaning, um, and it can extend from newspapers, fine arts, books, theatre, TV, etc., etc., etc. And of course, in more modern times, all the way to social media. So we are bombarded with information. Uh, particularly in the last 10, 20 years from social media. In the old days, when I was your age, you could, you could either buy a newspaper and read it or not buy a newspaper and read it. These days, whether you like it or not, you are bombarded with information. And a lot of our beliefs, they are derived from what we see in the media. Now, a good example here is the welfare question. The question number two, I think it was, what proportion of um, uh, welfare payments in the UK is fraudulently claimed. Um, and your, answer, your average answer was 30%. Um, the, the general public's general answer was 24%. The real answer is 0.7%. Now, this, this one touches me in particular because, believe it or not, within living memory, I've been claiming welfare. And it is the most impossible situation to find yourself in. You cannot afford to do anything. Once you've paid uh, your, your phone bill, which you need obviously, uh, and once you've paid for your electricity and gas and your water, you're living on about £20 a week. And to get welfare, you have to go through a... I think it's easier to get a passport, really, than to get welfare. It's actually really, really, really difficult. Um, so they make it really tough for you. Um, and I think the reason why people have this perception that a lot of welfare is, is fraudulently claimed is because maybe because of all those programs on TV. And for those of you who are from the UK, you've probably heard of Benefit Street, which came out about, I think, about eight, ten years ago. And then there was a whole franchise of programs about benefit, uh, you know, in love on benefits, uh, benefit mums, you know. And there's program after program after program that portrayed people on benefits as being lazy and feckless and a bit stupid. Right. And, and of course, the Daily Mail, they don't like welfare claimants. So they talk about um, 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 benefit fraud and so on. And yet, if you look at the flip side of that, what we don't hear too much about is tax fraud, which is exactly the same thing. That's money coming out of the public purse. Um, and you occasionally hear about Google or about Facebook not paying much tax. But uh, if you did a study, I'm sure you'd learn more about welfare uh, fraud than you do about tax fraud. Actually, there's a really good idea for a piece of research. So the media clearly um, has an influence in how we think about these things. So the next slide. So when we talk about, let me, let me just clarify something else as well. Um, again, this is really for the benefit of anybody who wants to think about, uh, about news. So again, terminology, a lot of terminology gets distorted. The news, otherwise known as journalism. Um, th that's th basically what, what journalism is, is newspapers, radio, TV, social media, websites and to a large extent advertising as well. So you, so the media itself is divided into different subcategories. And this is the area that I'm really passionate about and I've done a lot of work on, is, is the news media. So when we talk about the media, that's what we're talking about. All of those, let me just go back a slide. You might want to start thinking now about your research. So what you can do is you can focus on one of those areas. You can focus on, for example, the representation of Americans on British uh, social media. 
you know so try and narrow it down so don't try and do too much don't do the media as a, as a research subject the media because it's too enormous it's too enormous and um, it's you couldn't even do it in a, in a PhD you'd still have to narrow it down okay so that's the news media so um, let's talk now about just about why it's worthy of study hopefully you all you all agree that it's worthy of study otherwise you wouldn't have done this course right um, so why is the media worthy of study because when you think about it it helps us make sense of the world beyond our personal experience so we can't be everywhere at once so if we want to know what's happening in a baseball game in Boston or you know what's happening to it to uh, um, um, you know, the Australian economy or the, you know, if there's God forbid been an earthquake in Japan we need journalists and the media to tell us what's happening so we depend on it the media generally speaking massively to to help our understanding of the world what's happening in the world more importantly i would say it also helps us to make informed choices whether it's consumer choices about a product or whether it's political choices big election coming up in the states in, a, in about a month's time so that the me we depend on the media to, to tell us about the two candidates or the four candidates including the vice presidents it helps us make informed choice about life as well about health you know should you eat that should you eat something else and our beliefs and so on and a really crucial point which if you want to write something down I don't know what you like about taking notes but this idea of normative expectations can anybody tell me what a normative expectation is the clues in the name you can probably work it out what's a normative experience um, expectation no okay well a normative experience expectation is is basically what's normal what 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 would we expect something to be normally so I, I keep coming back to this because it's in it's in the in the news a lot at the moment but representation so we would expect the BBC the faces we see on the BBC we would expect it to reflect modern Britain you know, so we would expect not just white faces, but we would expect faces of other ethnicities as well. So that's a normative expectation. Likewise, we expect journalists to tell the truth. I know it's a big stretch of the imagination sometimes, but we do expect the news to be true. Right? We're not talking J.K. Rowling. We're not talking fiction with the news. We want what actually is the truth. So that's why the media is worthy of study.